Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar on dimensional and surface metrology. If you're looking for other ways to receive technical information, uh, both Steve Fox and Chuck Lynch, who's also our today's presenter, uh, they are doing a podcast. So Engine Professional Podcast is just another way to get technical information. Uh, they cover anything related to upcoming events. They look at uh, things like uh, the regionals, uh, shows, upcoming shows. They talk about that kind of stuff. I know the episode they just finished uh, here recently was episode 19, and they talk about compression ratios. Uh, they talk about uh, even the introduction of cruise control on vehicles way back when. So a little piece of history there too. So do check out that podcast. That's also on our website. You can go right to our website and click the podcast tab and check. Today, uh, we're really, really spoiled, actually. Mark Malberg from Digital Metrology Solutions, as well as Chuck Lynch. He's our director of, uh, of uh, technical services here. So you probably talk to him on the phone every now and then when you call us on the tech line. But both these gentlemen are gurus when it comes to surface finish. So I really encourage you to, if you got any questions, uh, you know, throw it at us. Let's let's see what you got. And uh, these two gentlemen are both going to help today. So I'm going to pass it over to both Chuck and to Mark. And how's it going today, guys? <clears throat> doing, doing great doing here. Great. <laughs> I'm looking forward Super. to this. I get to hang out us with too. the one and only Chuck Lynch. So, I mean, how good can that be? <clears throat> Super. Well, you, you, I can see your cameras and your sound is good. So, I'll, uh, I'll I'll leave it over to you guys, and like I say, any questions, we'll uh, we'll start. I'll interrupt you, and I'll st start throwing those at you. Awesome, our way. Is my screen being shared right now, Rob? Before you go, it is. It looks good. Yep. Awesome. All right, so I'll start out. Keep this brief, so we can hear from Mark. Um, <clears throat> so I'm Chuck Lynch, Director of Technical Services here at AERA. Um, I've had plenty of opportunity to work in a lot of different capacities in the industry, production engine rebuilder to uh, production engine rebuilders, application engineer, um, my time here at AERA, uh, service technician on equipment. And, uh, you know, I, I really gravitate toward machining. That's kind of kind of my passion, making chips fly and, you know, what impact that has on on the part and vice versa <laughs> so anyway i'll like to toss it over to mark so we can hear about mark yeah well thank you um i am your basic run-of-the-mill surface metrology guy i live my life describing shapes for people um coolest job on the planet it's it's like being an art critic with math so you know here's a cool shape spinning around on my screen and you know i work with people to describe what matters you know, figure out why things broke, why things don't work, and, you know, turn it into a measurement. I get to work in anything from engines to sporting goods to cell phones all the way to toilet paper. So um, some fascinating surfaces out there, but engines were kind of always my home. So I'm looking forward to the conversation today. Good stuff. <clears throat> So, um, you know, just kind of to, to kick this off a, a bit, I, th I think that there's, right now, it's so important to understand that there's more than just roughness. Yeah. Um, and I, I get this, I actually shared a question with you that just came to me recently. Sure. Okay, can I convert my roughness measurement to a waviness spec because now we have specifications around waviness? Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And um, let me give a little setup on that, because I think what you're touching on is where the world is right now. If we think back to how we used to make things, we started out with calipers, right? Um, you have to make it the right size. Um, the, the Revolutionary War was a great catalyst for in industry. They had to make bullets fit inside muskets. And if they didn't, you'd die. And that's where all our gauge companies started out, right? The New England states. So we've gone from size to the 1970s and 80s where we started thinking, well, it's not just how big it is, but where does it fit? Does the bolt hole pattern line up with the bolts? And we've gone from size to orientation, and today we're in the world of shape. So shapes, roughness, waviness, and all those things 
are where sealing and emissions and durability are all taking place. So the question of roughness and waviness is like spot on. It's how do we start thinking in the world of shape? And first off, Chuck, I think you particularly have that mindset of touch it and feel it and understand it. But somehow industry has gotten away from that craftsman mindset and they say, just give me a number. What's my RA? And there is no number that describes a shape. How would you describe, you know, this little piece of art with a number? It's not art because it's, you know, 18 inches tall. And how would you describe this, you know, ceiling deck on a block with a number? We can't. But the way we get there is to break it into pieces that we can manage. So here's a, a milled surface. And your, your question of roughness and waviness is, is really important because if we can break things into pieces we can manage, maybe then we can understand and specify some things that matter. So by way of quick intro, if we make a measurement, it's never lined up, so we're going to level it. Now that we've leveled this surface data, we're going to put some kind of smoothing through it. And smoothing our way through the surface is the act of creating waviness. We're going to take these long lumps as waviness and maybe put W parameters, WT, and then take it away. So subtracting the waviness away, we're left with roughness, the stuff that we use for RA. Roughness parameters start with R. So this is roughness, but looking at this particular data, I don't think ceiling is related to roughness here. Or if this was a bearing race, that's not going to dictate noise as much as perhaps the waviness. So people need to get into a mindset of going back to the surface itself and not just saying, what's my roughness? What's my waviness? But what is the shape and how do they play together? So to do this is super important. Uh, I looked back at about a three year window of my consulting gigs where people said this part worked from supplier A and supplier B didn't work yet they both meet specs. What's wrong? 80% of the time, the thing that was wrong was waviness. They just didn't specify it. They weren't aware of it. So you're touching on a really important topic. Here's the sad part of the story, though. To see waviness, we need to use a gauge that doesn't have a skid. We need to use a roughness gauge that only has a stylus and then it pulls that stylus along a reference bar inside the gauge. It can't just rest on the surface and use the surface as a reference. We need a precision reference to measure waviness. So if I measured this surface with a skidless gauge, I'll see waviness, but a skidded gauge will not see it. The skid follows the humps. So there's no way to make waviness out of skidded data. We can't put it back in. It's lost. <laughs> Has to be captured along the way. <laughs> it does, right. It's, um, you know, if you're using your fingernail to measure the road texture, you might not realize you're standing on a hill. And the, the skidded gauge is kind of that. You're standing on a hill while the stylus wiggles up and down. So um, almost um, everybody starts out in the roughness world with a skidded gauge, and the skid provides a reference. And if the skid goes up over a wave, the stylus doesn't know it. So was there a little more to that question you had online, Chuck? Yeah, so in today's speak, we most everything um, is MLS when it comes to head gaskets. Yeah, yeah. And it wasn't that many long years ago that we had very conformable materials, you know, a 301 stainless steel wrapped around a perforated core gasket and had graphite. Uh -huh. So in, in those waves, the gasket could conform. Yeah. And it was kind of the suspension bridge thing. Now with the MLS, depending on the frequency and the amplitude of that wave, mm -hmm. we just can't conform to it. Right. So, you know, one of the things that I, I share often, if you have a, you know, I got compression in the cooling system or whatever, but the head gasket doesn't look hurt. It, right. because of the materials it just doesn't yield like the the softer materials that got pushed out of the way with a conventional head gasket 
Right. So, you know, to actually take the layers, pull the gasket apart and look and you see, you know, I've seen like tiger stripes mm. in the stopper layer. Well, compression's going through the gasket. Um, you know, things like Fuji impression paper and so forth, they help us see that as well. Right. But the, you know, it's really telling that there's waviness when you look between the layers of the gasket. But that's too late to find out, right? You don't want right. to. <laughs> right. And, um, you know, some of that, and I'm going to pull up this. That's a topic I didn't think about here. I'm going to grab a quick presentation here I just gave recently. Um, it's a matter of, you know, uniform pressure, but also uniform pressure. We can't make things flat enough to be good. We're going to have to rely on a gasket at some point. So these two surfaces, you can see by your eye, again, being the, the skilled machinist engine guy, you can say, I can envision a gasket following that top surface, but it's going to struggle with this bad mill where there was a bad insert and maybe some, some squareness. Both of those surfaces are identical in terms of roughness and waviness. So those two surfaces on the screen have the same RA, the same RZ, and the same WT, but one is going to leak. And even if it doesn't leak below the gasket, there's going to be less compression within the gasket, to your point. So the picture is, is huge, and then we do have more advanced parameters around the picture where we can mathematically act like a gasket and predict that leakage. Great topic, though. You know, and it's it's funny, just recently, so um, Dan Bagley and Randy Neal and I have been talking about this on journal surfaces as well, crankshaft, yeah. mm -hmm. shaft, but in particular, we've been looking at like the journal surfaces where uh, it would have a, you know, a sliding bearing in contact um, or in, in that application. So a rod bearing, main bearing. Right. And those like that lower picture that's a particular situation you're seeing um where oil m matters more than ever because you know we've got zero w8 oil certified and we're going to be certifying zero w4s and those valleys are going to give it opportunity for the oil to escape right and we've got you know harder bearing material material we've got a smaller cross-sectional surface area of bearing yeah now my my peak oil you know the oil film pressure is extremely high right oil film strength is getting weak wussy yeah yeah terrible situation yeah so you know in that realm um i'm seeing you know the the movement in you know oems is going beyond roundness you know just like we've gone beyond roughness into waviness uh this is you know, a data set that has a bunch of chatter in it. The chatter is super big, but if that whole thing was egg-shaped with the same amount of roundness, you know, seven microns or uh, we'll flip to imperial here. So it's, it's a nasty surface, but you know, 278 millionths of ovality is very different than 278 millionths of chatter. And people are getting smarter about looking at total roundness on a shaft, on a bearing, and also looking at what frequencies are present and how much we have. So there are people right now that are specifying crank journal surfaces with a roundness and then also a sector roundness. So within a 30 degree window, you're only allowed so much and you're not allowed to have high frequencies of chatter via, via um, kind of a chatter analysis down here at the bottom. So the, the people that are, you know, spending their lives optimizing a shaft are speaking this language down here now. What frequencies can I tolerate? Just like you're saying, each one of these little bumps is going to, you know, squish out an oil film. Yeah, I think... <clears throat> One of the big challenges, okay, now that I find it uh, in the finished part, mm -hmm. got to go backwards and eliminate it and think about some of the things that are impactful. You know, could be simply, you know, that we start with the easiest things first, you know, a soft foot on the machine. Right. You right. Do is level the machine and make sure that it's making full contact. 
yes. do I have enough footing under the piece of equipment or am I just, you know, vibrating or, you know? Yeah. Well, <laughs> on the vibrating one, see if I can find it here. Um, it's right here. I was with a customer and they were saying, we don't have a chatter problem. Whoops, let me turn off my raw data. They were looking at data like this that was filtered about like this and they couldn't figure out why they were having well thumb problems. That part looks nice and round, 60 millionths was a large crank and they were living their lives thinking it must be something other than roundness or chatter. Their shop floor gauge gave this kind of plot, but they didn't realize in the background, if we pop in the raw data, they had a very high frequency chatter on that surface due to bearings and speeds in the grinder. But in the world of traditional measurement, we don't often see the unfiltered signal. We just see what you know the gauge gives us. And no way were they going to find this problem until you get smarter. So guys, uh, just a couple questions. Since we are talking about machines here right now, um, one of the questions that's come in, um, you know, are older honing machines capable of supporting enough to keep with modern surface finishes and tolerances? Hey, Chuck, you want to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm I'm going to actually give a toss out to, to Ed Keebler because he always uses this as, as an opportunity for, okay, the more abrasives that you can apply, the more roundness and you know you it's about distributing the load more evenly right so let more parts do the do the work so you're doing smaller chunks of work you know there is a point where you get to diminishing return you get 12 honing slots or something on your hone head after that it doesn't really improve much more so that the older machines um depending on the application if you have a nice rigid part that can accept the force and and so forth they're going to be able to to do that but you need to be able to recognize where you're having deflection chatter um distortion and so forth and so if if you can check then you can probably adjust for the older machines but the problem is we really oftentimes can't check so therefore we can't adjust so it's kind of a it's kind of a question of you know which which is really coming first hit there if yeah. i can't check it then i can't adjust it and if i can't so i can't say that it's good enough yeah and i'll i'll i'll, I'll yes and you there first first rule of improv right yes and <laughs> uh, um Certainly there's the geometry implication. I mean, this is data from an incometer and yeah, you know, we can start to see that there's some wobbly stuff going on and there's an element of stiffness and bearings that go into the geometry and you know stroke positioning. One of the challenges we also see um, with the older machines is can we repeatably put a plateau in the middle of the valleys? It's that last pass of the process where we've already established size, we've laid down the base valley texture, can we control that last kiss of the fine stone? And that's where some machines just don't have the constant pressure where, you know, 12 strokes with a fine stone puts the plateau in exactly the sweet spot, because sometimes it might take 10 and sometimes it might take 14. So some of the critical nature of sur some of the critical features within surface texture are where the challenges are, and yeah, I'd love to hear Ed's take as well. Yeah, and you know the the thing is, we know that people aren't going to be able to walk away from this presentation and say, okay, I either give up or you know I I got to get there tomorrow. Um, you know, you eat an elephant one bite at a time. But if you understand what to be looking for and, you know, what the factors are, then 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 you can build some goals about how to get there. What do I do first and second and third? So um, but, you know, that's one of the things that I argue often because some people hate CNC stuff. Mm -hmm. you know, 
don't have the touch, you don't have the feel, you know, you people that are just pushing buttons don't know what's going on behind, but they do have controls that are much better than us. We're, you know, that machine is not going to get distracted by your, by its cell phone. Sure. Uh, you're not going to be midway into a process and so forth. And so when it, when you tell it to run up and do three strokes at this pressure or whatever, it's going to do it. It's just numbers. It has, there's no emotion. It's right. just doing something to a parameter that you set. Mm -hmm. uh, that said, there's also things like filtration of your coolant, the specific gravity of the coolant, yep. um, you know, the bond hardness. We have how many different block materials that we may stick in a machine. So there's an infinite amount of variables now. And you look, now we have compacted graphite blocks. We have the plasma transfer. They spray weld cylinders, um, you know a lightweight aluminum that's got a light sleeve in it and there's going to be gaps between the sleeve and the block no matter what you, there's always settling and so forth so there's never ending amount of challenges but you if you think about the challenges going into it and you know at least think of it i think many times there's get no consideration given further than okay this is how a home runs yeah. Exactly. And, and let me jump on that because um, particularly with lights out manufacturing, we need to get our eyes in there and just go explore. You know, if, if you're saying, yep, my diameter is good, my RA is good, whatever you're checking, to be able to walk around that surface once in a while and say, what am I really getting? And maybe you've got the older machine and you're trying to push it to its limits you're going to learn more from being an explorer than you are from looking at a chart of numbers. You know, get in there, feel the surface, see it. Um, you know, it's been interesting watching uh, people light up when they see a shape rather than a number. And that's how we keep old machines alive. I've kind of spent a lot of my career dealing with, you know, upgrading manufacturing processes, whether it's hones or boring operations, mills, whatever. And we've never solved it with a number. We really solve it by looking at the picture and seeing a shape and going, oh, I know where that shape came from. Right, right. So I think there was an example, um, you know, going back to chatter. Mm -hmm. I shared a I shared an image with you and yeah, great picture. Let me pull it up for everybody to see here. Uh it was that one. Cool stuff, man. Right. And, and actually, um, I've seen this happen many times with the with the CNC homes, where someone would get close to size, and they didn't want to change anything too much, so they would hit like cycle start, let it do a couple strokes, and then interrupt the cycle. Oh my! Just drag it out. We didn't allow it to actually get to the load setting that it that we had set as a parameter. Wow. And not run its cycle. So, mm -hmm. okay, this is an important cycle. We build a cycle, but it's not so important that I'm going to stick to it. So I'm going to interrupt it because I want my gauge to read this. And wow. so when you hit it with a brush, you don't see that. But actually, when it runs just a, a few, maybe, maybe even miles, it may not take that long, but you're just right. going to highlight the chatter, the high points on the chatter. So, yeah. And, Ultimately, that picture shows such a great example. Piston rings care a lot about local deviations. They don't care about ovals so much. They can bend, but they can't bend at that frequency. Um, I'd love to give some details. I'm working with a, a modeling expert right now, and the modeling they're doing of piston ring conformability is wild stuff. And it's practically nothing to do with roundness. It's everything to do with what's going on at local curves and bumps. So yeah, that's that's important stuff. Yeah. So to that point, just think about it. we said okay, the MLS head gaskets they can't conform to high frequency bumps. Right. <laughs> the bearing doesn't like high frequency bumps. Exactly. The piston ring doesn't. So it it's definitely something that we should be considering more for many applications within the engine. Yeah, um, let me throw one up here that kind of speaks to how you can do it wrong. 
Um, and I can share this one. This is way back in my Cummins career. Uh, and this is data that we've published, so I can share it. I wouldn't normally share customer data. But this was from a crank pen. You can see it by the file name. And you can imagine Cummins, so it's diesel. The crank pin was eating up bearings. And that's bad when a big engine wants to grab onto a bearing. So the goal was we need to make it straighter. We've got a, a straightness problem looking at this surface. It's not straight enough. And a big effort was put into making a straighter crank pin. Now this crank pin has an oil hole in the middle, so anything you do grinding or lapping, the oil hole removes some garbage, makes you cut better, plus a tape lapper is gonna spend more time in the middle because you're overlapping as you oscillate. So everything about this pin makes it, makes it hourglass shaped. So the effort was underway, and this is 30 years ago, to make these things straighter so they wouldn't fail. Turns out straightness doesn't matter. In fact, the way this works with a soft bearing on top of it, the bearing will follow the, the U shape. This is, you know, two and a half inches of data. So this long wavelength shape, it can be really, quote, bad, but the fact that you've got a squishy surface against it compensates for that. The reason things were failing is if we take that long curvy shape out of it, there were humps along the way. And these little humps along the way matched exactly on the wear, with the wear scars on the bearing. So it wasn't a straightness problem. In fact, tightening the straightness tolerance only made it more expensive. You gotta grind better, you gotta lap better, make it straighter, make it straighter, make it straighter. And that wasn't the issue. The issue was get rid of these guys. You can have, you know, 10 microns of straightness, but you can't have two microns of waviness. Another, you know, squishy so guy, interface. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so speaking of waviness, um, just a couple more questions in regards to that coming in. Uh, the question is, is how do roughness and waviness affect sticking and sliding friction between parts moving against each other? Is it possible for parts to be too smooth and or too flat for lowest sticking and sliding performance in use. Chuck, you wanna weigh in on that? I've got some stuff right here I'll share, but you're Mr. Practical, I like that. <laughs> no, I would run with it, Mark. <laughs> I'll run with it. Um, and I've got a ton of respect for Chuck, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick on him along the way today. Uh, no, I don't need updates. I'm gonna webcam something here that is super relevant. Um, so this is, guess what? It's an iPhone. Um, the logo on an iPhone is crazy smooth. That's just the way Apple makes them. Wish I could get focused here. So the smoothest part of the phone is the Apple. As I slide my finger around, it's crazy slippery but if I touch the apple, it grabs. The smoothest part of the iPhone is the stickiest part. It's slippery here, slippery, 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 and then it grabs. So we've got to, you know, first off realize that friction isn't just a roughness thing. Friction is roughness combined with hardness is kind of the most simplified view we can have. A soft, squishy finger against a hard iPhone is gonna grab when things get slippery or, or smooth. Uh, but also hard smooth against hard smooth is why gauge blocks stick together. Yeah, ringing gauge blocks, I was exactly. gonna use that as an example. Yeah, so two hard, flat, smooth surfaces are infinite friction. Um, I've had gauge blocks that I can't get apart. So um, what I find in many cases, and I see this in rollers, I've seen this in camshafts, is people will see improvement by making things smooth until they cross a threshold. And they're going to cross some threshold where lubrication matters more than roughness. So your mileage may vary, but I would keep that in mind. Uh, Chuck, you have anything on that kind of going too smooth history? Just the ability to, you know, for retention 
Um, you know, there's been tests done where you get to the point where, okay, the oil needs something to grip as well. So yes. as, you know, RPMs increase, you actually throw the oil away from the surface. Right. That's not necessarily a good condition to create. It's been done with, you know, high RPM crankshafts and they take it too far. Yeah, good, great point. Excellent. Yeah. So um, there is, quote, this idea of you can't make a surface too good, meaning smooth. Well, no, good isn't smooth. Um, smooth can be very bad in some cases. Now, the question was related to waviness. And um, there's a trade off in this world that's worth pointing out. If I'm making a surface, let's put a little light on this if I can. Um, and I know I'm producing waviness, some roughness along the way gives me room to break in. So if I so This is have a live a, version of Notebook. <laughs> yeah, the Notepad Series Live, look at that. So that surface, if I'm going to, and it's the actual camera, the actual pens, you know, this is legit. Um, <laughs> if I'm gonna rub into that surface, I stand a better chance to break in with some roughness but if I didn't have the roughness, if my surface was this with waves along the way, I'm not going to break in. I'm going to start melting and smearing material around. Same waviness hidden by roughness gives me a chance to break in. This is why we put some plateau roughness in our cylinder bores, is to give the rings a chance to eat away some roundness. Do you have anything else, Rob? I do. Um, so they're asking, um, how is chatter and frequency measured on a shaft? Is it a profilometer or they're asking, how is that measured? Sure. Uh, let's bring one up. So first off, if you can see my webcam, there's a roundness gauge right over my shoulder here. Um, and I'll show you the real thing because that's a prototype of this little bench top version. Now I can't endorse any products because I work for all the companies, but this one is actually running software that I write. So this is the kind of device that would do that. This is a roundness gauge. It has a precision spindle, and we have to have something that's precisely round um, or precise round reference like a precision air spindle. We can't do this with dial bore gauges. There's no way to stack up a picture like this or um, like this one with just simple diameters. We have to have the ability to scan a surface. Now, once we've scanned the surface, then we can do some math to figure out what's hiding inside it. Uh, let's go to uh, digitalmetrology.com. I know where I can find one faster there if the internet is as fast as my brain. What? Bad gateway. Oh, I'm in a webinar. Okay, stand by. Um, <laughs> yeah, the two point measurement is whether it's a dial bore gauge or a micrometer or whatever, that is, it's something that trips us up a lot. I think more so yeah. in probably the engine repair because we aren't necessarily working in the realm of GD and T um it's much more it's like the passed on this is how we do this again in the engine repair world so oftentimes we don't think like this so round is what the micrometer tells me it is or round is what the dial board gauge tells me it is exactly it's exactly of the jargon yeah so roundness is truly a departure from a circle not a variation in diameter so, you know, like here, this picture using a mic, um, that's not roundness, that's diameter variation. And in fact, if you use that gauge, a British 50 pence coin would be perfectly round. It's the same diameter everywhere you look. And fun fact, it's made that way, so it works in vending machines. No matter which orientation you put it in, it fits. So that's not roundness. Roundness really comes from scanning the, the surface. Now, the question on chatter and understanding chatter is, is a little more interesting. Um, we start with an idea of chatter that any round shape can be 
decomposed into sine waves. So in this case, I've created four sine waves and put them together to make a roundness plot. But mathematically, we can go the other way also. And this is super awesome because um, I can take a measured data set and tell you how much of each sine wave lives inside it. Really cool stereos do this. You're listening to music on a really cool stereo and you see the graphic equalizer bars bouncing up and down, the low notes and the high notes. They're doing exactly the same thing as this, this math of saying, how strong are the low notes, you know, ovality? How strong is three lobe? There's a 17 lobe in here, how strong is it? So we can look at chatter and see what frequencies are present. And sometimes we can even match it up with a manufacturing process. We know that this grinder, you know, if we don't set it up right, we get seven UPR chatter or lobing. So this is mathematically how we can do this. And we actually, you know, in many places, people are putting tolerances on this curve. That is really, really popular in bearings, crankshafts, camshafts, um, to actually put a tolerance on those bars. Uh, just for fun, let's bring up a, a really fun one. You guys need a brain break right now, I can tell. Um, if we measured a quarter, this is a US quarter, you know, 25 cents worth. Uh, let's turn off some filtering. A quarter has 119 serrations. And if we do this kind of chatter analysis, we can see my quarter is kind of oval. So there's a real strong two undulation per revolution. There's a strong three, which means it's kind of triangle hiding inside. But also we can see at 119, there's a real strong chatter out here. There's 119 serrations on the quarter. So that's kind of a little glimpse into that world of diagnosing and specifying and you know, putting it on a drawing, I need to control chatter. So in this case, uh, let's go to this first one. We would put tolerance limits on this that say if you exceed this red curve, that's a bad part, it's not going to work. There's too much chatter at this frequency. So Mark, so, how do you measure chatter then? How, what's the best way to measure chatter? Yeah, the best way to measure it really goes back to the roundness gauge. So we're going to need to you know, scan the part with something that you know, rotates the part and scans it. We're getting better with coordinate measuring machines. Uh, so you know, bench top and you know, standalone roundness gauges would look like this, where we're spinning your part. Uh, there are systems like the Incometer for getting inside, or Taylor Hobson makes a, a tally series bore gauge, um, big overhead spindle version. And, you know, coordinate measuring machines are becoming more popular. Certainly the Renishaw um, probe will, you know, scan yeah. and do roundness like, scanning, a like a PH20 with scanning. Or the... Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> or the or the, the Revo, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So... There are lots of ways of getting there. There are optical ways. This is an optical system for doing full cylindricity. But we've got to start with scanning the data and getting this picture first, and then we can math out the chatter, count the bumps, look at the wiggles. So it's all, you have to project that theoretical center line. Yes. Which you, you can't do with two point gauging. So you have to project it. Yeah. So um, this data is pretty much on center. If I, you know, tell it to plot centered, you'll see it wiggle in a little bit. But we've got to start with centered data. Actually, this math brings the center out of it also. But it has to be scanned relative to a center. You're right on, Chuck. All right. So, you know, I do a lot of talks about machining valve guides and seats. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's it's paramount if, you, you know, if you don't have a datum point for the seat. Yes. You're losing before you begin. So, yeah, that's a that's a tough one. You've got to a strange long L over D of the guide and then like nothing on the seat to work with. So that's, that's tough. And the valve has, has much of the same itself. So right. I have two conflicting parts that I'm trying to put together sometimes. And then as yes. the valve rotates, mm -hmm. I know earlier in, you were talking about like the chatter in, in the, that's what you'll see in valve seats. Like, Oh, well, we're allowed two thousands run out, but is the 2000s run out in one small area? That's, oh. you know, we vacuum test a lot. 
<laughs> when, you, when you vacuum test and well a vacuum test just fine well it's got seven thousands run out and still a vacuum test because the run out is uniform over a great distance and now we have small valve stems and we can bend the valve head you know but yes 25 inches of vacuum you ever watch mythbusters they collapsed a rail car right that was awesome yeah. that was that was super cool i yeah i'm looking for a data set to highlight what you're talking about here um a surface like this let's you know pretend it's a valve seat it could have potentially some big shape but if it's got a, a small ripple along the way we're not going to know that unless we scan it and that's a big old vent exactly so scratches on a valve seat or right uh or the valve face itself something of that nature so mm -hmm. I always contend to everyone, uh, whatever your stem to guide clearance is, is the maximum you can allow for your valve seat run out. Okay. Because you have two cones that you're trying to force together, mm -hmm. the valve seat, the valve face. So if you have more uh, run out than you have clearance, and then yes. I have that tail of that valve swinging in, it's going to be contacting the guide excessively. Mm -hmm. Right. We know what's going to happen anyway, but it's really going to be applying extra force then. So Yes. And there still is some little bit of compliance along the way, but wiggles you can't comply for. Right. So if you had all of that run out in one local spot versus all of it like a Pringles potato chip, you're you're still going to see differences. So yeah, the that that shape conversation is awesome. Hopefully Guys, for we, those we, that are, I'm sorry, I was say hopefully for those that are listening in, at least I can give you enough pictures today to get your brains thinking about shapes. That's my goal. So, <laughs> Well, and then speaking about shapes, earlier in the presentation, you were talking about roundness. And so I, I know like in the shop sort of environment, we talk about, you know, we use our dial bore gauge and we check that bore. Oh, it's perfectly round. Or we throw a mic on the, you know, on our raw journal. We say, oh, that's perfectly round. But you know, is there is there maybe another term we should be using to define roundness? Is there something we should be doing, or maybe you could broaden or just expand on that a bit? Yeah, um, it's 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 a it's a bit of a religious debate. Um, <laughs> in the world of measurement, we talk about roundness. That's just kind of what these things have been called. These are called roundness gauges. If you're googling them, in the world of geometric dimensioning and tolerancing, the word circularity is used. And um, so they both mean the same thing. We don't have any standards for diameter variation. So using the bore gauge, using the mic, um, there isn't a word for that. This is a diameter measurement. And if you spin the part, you're seeing variation in diameter. You're not seeing roundness. So for industry people actually making stuff, the word roundness is the right word but this is the wrong measurement. Perfect, no, that, that makes sense. Like the orders of geometry, multiple, okay. You see the lobing, you see, you know, the triangular yeah. shape, three lobed, five lobed, seven lobed. You... Right. So yeah, let's blow up this cylinder bore. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot going on that's not really lobing. That's you know maybe at the bottom of this we could see a difference with the dial bore gauge. You could see down here at the bottom it's you know long in this direction and narrow in this direction. But up here at the top where we've got potentially five lobes going on, the dial bore gauge isn't really going to offer much help near the top of this surface where you know maybe head bolts were interact, interacting or a torque plate was messed up. But, you know, this view of reality of a 3D cylinder is what we're trying to control. And envision this, can we control this by just simply measuring diameters? Maybe we could at the bottom, but not in general. And I think to jump back, though, for the people that are terrified of, okay, can I make a cylinder that's any good? <laughs> yeah. The quality of the hone head, you know, mm -hmm. is is paramount of course you got to keep all the universal joints and you know every other component of the machine it's got to be maintained uh but the quality of the hone head really kind of dictates the quality of the cylinder you can produce sure 
Yeah. And thanks for bringing me back to reality, Chuck. <laughs> All right. Well, guys, let's talk about waviness again for a second. Um, sure. So, you know, it's 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 been mentioned that waviness is important to the performance of an MLS gasket. But what could cause waviness? You know, mm -hmm. what are most folks doing as far as speeds and feeds for roughness? And can speed, can you can you get waviness in or out by using speed? Oh, there's a real deep level conversation I'd love to have um, on this. Let's see if we can touch it quickly enough. Um, so let's look at, you know, milling. Now, this isn't necessarily at the scale of, you know, a gasketed surface, but it shows what milling looks like for people who haven't seen one. There are two different things going on in the world of waviness and gaskets. One is we can produce waviness through our process, and the other is what is the specification asking for? So let's talk, um, how are we on time? I'll see if I can do this in about two minutes. We can see this kind of surface pretty often in the world of milling. This surface came about from two different errors in a, in a mill similar to this, probably a lot bigger. One is we can have a, a proud or tall tooth that digs in. And you, you guys see my mouse, right? Is my mouse showing up on your side? Yeah. Okay, so one tooth digs in, the next tooth up has an easy life because the material's already removed until it works its way back out. Another error is if this head isn't square and it wobbles once per revolution, making a sine wave. So this is a cool data set. It's got both problems hiding inside. We've got a sine wave, so a head that's not square and a tooth that's deep. So that's going to happen at once per rev. So this case, it's two and a half millimeters per revolution. So we can see the spacing. We see that this happens and it shows up as two and a half millimeters per revolution. It shows up in a graph of wavelengths. But our question is, what does this mean in terms of roughness and waviness? In the world of roughness and waviness, we're gonna to try to separate the short waves as roughness, the long waves as waviness. And I can make this surface look really good or really bad depending on how you've specified. So we can make it look super smooth or we can push everything into the roughness side and make it look rough with no waviness. So we have to start talking about the language of specifying what wavelengths are going to be roughness, what wavelengths are going to be waviness, and then this blue spike, where does my process live? Is my feed rate all going to live in waviness or is my feed rate all going to live in roughness? So much of this comes by looking at the picture and saying, hey, where's my feed rate, where's roughness, where's waviness? Here's the bad part of the story. Uh, let me switch back to the old notepad here. Many years ago, like in the 1990s, the gasket industry almost as a whole, across the board, all the suppliers, um, were thinking about roughness being these short wavelengths, waviness being middle wavelengths, and then maybe flatness out here. So all of these wavelengths, and they had roughness pretty well under control with things like RA or maybe RZ, and then they would have some kind of flatness requirement. In the 90s, waviness became interesting and people said, oh, to make waviness as a measurement, we need to take a longer trace with our diamond. Our diamond roughness measurement was a short trace. We need a longer trace to see waviness. And they made a mistake of specifying waviness as a group of longer wavelengths. They put waviness out here and left a dead zone. This dead zone is where many many block lines have ended up with their feed rates. So it's not being captured as roughness, it's not being captured as waviness, and yet your surface looks like garbage. So um, the picture is really telling, but the gasket industry as a whole, uh, just about everywhere I went and have gone in the future, they're specifying roughness with a 30 thou cutoff, and they're specifying waviness with a hundred thou cutoff, and there's a dead zone in between. So here's the trick: put your serve, you put your process right in between, and it'll always measure good, but it'll always leak. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, speaking of sealing, uh, I've got another question about that, about sealing surfaces. Does any unevenness impact clamping pressure between surfaces and does the friction movement between any two dissimilar materials flatten itself out? Mm. Um, maybe. Chuck, talk about Fuji paper for those that have not seen it or experienced it because that's the great visualizer. Right, so just loosely threw the term out earlier um, for those who haven't experienced and I know some of the folks that are registered today have definitely they use that tool a bunch but uh, Fuji paper um, back in the day we had carbonless impression paper that we bolted between parts you know you've probably seen receipts that if you apply pressure on the top sheet of paper it transfers to the, the bottom sheet well the Fuji impression paper has like little ink globules that are in a mylar and as you apply pressure, um, there's different globules that break at different pressures and they'll distribute throughout that mylar. And you can you can simply just look at it because there's there's plenty of material that is just visible to the eye anyway, and you're gonna see pink and bright red and so forth. And you can make the determinations based without having a machine. But if you want to know what the actual pressures applied to uh get that particular breakout of those uh cells you can put them in a machine and it can look at that data and give you a graph and say okay at this particular area you had 10,500 psi and at this area you were 6,500 psi mm -hmm. so it's uh one of the probably the best ways to actually combat this question about you know surface flatness for gaskets that that exists because you know when you're looking at the at the numbers um you you probably have to be able to compare those to what you got with the fuji paper to kind of bring it back around yeah so the number means nothing until you have it something tangible to tie it to right so yeah, and there is that trade, um, and I I hear conversations about it. I've not seen things definitive, but on that gasket, you know, do we need roughness for traction to keep the gasket from sliding around? Maybe, but I don't know how much we really need. So it's a really great question, and my answer is your mileage may vary. Yeah, and I think that years ago when we had different materials, mm -hmm. it did matter much more. But you know, you look at specifications for MLS gaskets. A lot of times, they don't have a, really a bottom limit for smoothness, right. Right. Uh, because then they have materials put over like Teflon. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they have the cold seal material, but the cold seal material may have stuff that's got a great amount of lubricity, uh, so that they don't have micro welding or spalling or false brunelling or so forth. Right. Right. So yeah, it's it's a great question. It tells me you're thinking, but I don't know for each application if there's one answer. Mark, I know um, uh, I've watched some of your. You know, we mentioned earlier in the in the presentation about your notebook uh, series. Do you have anything that you could show the folks on how to how to get to that? I, I know you know you've done a bunch of YouTube videos and you've got some really good information out there. Maybe if you could just show the folks on uh, how they could um, get yeah. onto that stuff. Um, so digitalmetrology.com has a ton of resources. Um, the notepad series and the blog are kind of the two big ones. Uh, the surface texture answer book, I can give a shameless plug here because Carl did all the heavy lifting, but this is literally an answer book. You don't have to read it like a textbook. It's got, I don't know, more than 100 questions relative to anything you might want to know about roughness. But back to resources, the notepad series is a series of really light-hearted, um, no math, five-minute videos. What is roughness? You know, what is roughness and waviness? What's RA? So five minutes at a time, you can knock these guys out and act like an expert. But that's resources at digitalmetrology.com. Uh, lots of fun stuff here. Surface library, you can download all these different surfaces and play with them if you want to see what surface texture feels like. But I love giving it away. This is this is what I love to do. I appreciate the opportunity today. I know we're up against the time here. So I'll give it back yeah. to you, Rob. Sure. Are you, are you able to share with us kind of uh, some of the 
latest and greatest you're working on, some of the new stuff maybe that you've been plugging or but we're working on. We I know you kind of shared with it yesterday and it was really intriguing, but I don't know if you're allowed to share that or not. Um, no, I've got some things in the works. Uh, one thing that's in the works is for, uh, let's go back to the camera here, for these guys, um, for you know your portable roughness gauges. This is a Handy Surf Plus. I'm working with Mitatoyo to see if we can get them on board with everybody else. Uh, just a lightweight surface finish package. Next level, if you've got a skidded gauge, what's your next move? Well, your next move would be an affordable way of looking at it and saving the data on your computer. So that's what I'm doing on the low end. Um, what I'm working on on the higher end right now is doing quite a lot of work relative to some exotic stuff like injector spray hole geometry. So that's that's my wild mathematical outlet. Uh, cylinder bores. This is um, some. This is a toolbox where I'm developing some new stuff for cylinder bores. I'm I'm always dealing with something shape related. So yeah, there's there's a lot going on. Uh, you can sign up for my newsletter. This next newsletter is going to be great. There's going to be a whole bunch of new stuff and some use, user case studies as well. So thanks for that, Rob. Yeah, no, thank you. And like I say, I've watched the Notepad series. Um, it really breaks down into layman's terms. I find uh, just just how to, to 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 figure out, you know, our all the different surface finishes and and puts it into easy language. I found so. And just with your being able to use your camera and your pen and all that, it uh, it keeps you engaged. So I, I encourage everybody to check that out. And it's got cheesy music in the background too, right? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I, I I wanted it to be you know entry level so um, even the music. Now I've got a great guy that helps me with those so these have been fun. Um, if you have topics for the Notepad series, let me know because uh, coming up with a topic is almost a bigger challenge. Hopefully we help that today. Yeah. And these engine guys have some questions. <laughs> yes. Well, guys, just, just to kind of respect everybody's time, uh, and I know you both are busy, um, any questions that we've got that come in, I'll make sure that we forward to those to both Chuck and to Mark, and uh, and they'll be good at getting back to you. Um, I really appreciate your time, Mark. I know you're super busy, and it was just, I mean, this was a real treat for us, and hopefully we can, you know, meet again at PRI, and, and, and uh, we can get you back on. I, I know we only just, you know, scratched the surface on some of the uh, stuff you're even <laughs> capable of showing us, but... Uh, yeah, really appreciate it. So thank you. And uh, and Chuck, yeah, same thing. I know you're busy. So thank you for taking the time to, to put this together for us. And uh, it was really, really good information. So thanks again. Yeah, thanks, Chuck, for herding the cats with me. Um, you do a good job of keeping me on track. And your experience is incredible. So uh, really great working with you, Chuck. Absolutely. And likewise, uh, I think many years ago or something, I had reached out to you wanting to borrow a slide and it created a friendship from that. Just, you know, I'm going to try to get a hold of that guy. <laughs> well, I appreciate be. what you do. <laughs> All right. So what I'll do guys is I'm going to go back to Amanda here for just a little bit and uh, we'll wind things down. And if you have any more questions, just throw them in the, uh, Amanda's going to show you how to use that. Um, be able to, there's a survey and there's a, a place there where you can put more questions if you got them. So again, guys, thank you. And uh, you have a good rest of your day. All right, real quick, um, all our webinars can be viewed on YouTube. Takes me a few days to get the newest one up there, but if you haven't already, go out to YouTube, search AERA Engine Builders or Engine Builders Association, find our page and hit that subscribe button. Um, that way, any of these webinars you may miss or that you want to recheck out or share with someone else, you can find them all there. It's a great resource um, that we have out there for you guys. And then lastly, Thanks as always for attending. Um, as Rob mentioned, there will be a survey that pops up when you leave today. Take a moment, fill it out, let us know how we're doing. If you have any additional questions for Mark or for the team here at AERA, there are spots to put those um, within that survey. You can also reach anyone at the AERA team by calling 815-526-7600, or as you can see, and also Chuck's are listed there. Feel free to shoot any of us an email, and if we can't help you, we'll find somebody who can. So, as always, thank you. We know you guys are busy. We appreciate you taking time out of your day, and I hope you have a great afternoon.
Thank you.